something is wrong, you feel alone, you don't know how to deal with the problem. You're starting to feel like there's no way out, it's getting hopeless. You don't know what to do. You could ask for help, but you're afraid of the judgment. Maybe they won't understand, or worse, they'll think it's your fault. Is there anyone else you can turn to? Welcome to The Chrissy B Show, the UK's only TV programme that's dedicated to your mental health and well-being. So today we're talking about the importance of reaching out to get help for everything from personal issues to family, career and household problems. We'll be exploring this in real depth by showing you how we tackled the topic when we were invited to film at the Helplines Partnership Annual Conference and Awards Ceremony. We talked to Helplines user Karami Roberts as well as resident psychologist Dr Audrey Tang. We also spoke to representatives of Scope, Kirsty Frost and Darlington Young Carers Linda O'Neill. And as it's Young Carers Day on the 25th of January, we'll also be talking to a young carer and daughter of Keremi, Emily Roberts, on what she faces, as well as hear the psychological trials young carers can face with Dr. Audrey Tang. Resident nutritionist Hannah Richards gives us a show-stopping recipe demonstration. Helena Shard gives you the latest positive and feel-good news with presenter Julianne Robertson. But before we get into any of that, what do you on Twitter think about helplines? Chloe says, I remember how unhappy I was this exact time last year. I was messaging and calling helplines every day or even every few days because I was just so low and anxious and suicidal. I'm not at my best right now, but I've sure as hell made some good progress this past year. Abby says, I've used Samaritans, Charity Sane, Rethink, Mind Charity helplines in the past and they've got me through some difficult times. Attack on Jaffa says, people wonder why people are constantly committing suicide. It's because we don't talk about it much in schools or anywhere. Maybe if we talked about it more, giving people helplines and handing out a hand and ear to people who need it. We need to bring this up. And Phil says, out of the blue, one of my tutors just emailed everyone in class a list of numbers and helplines to call if we're feeling stressed about assignments and need somebody to talk to. So some interesting thoughts on helplines there. But there are more to helplines than we first originally thought. And to help you get up to speed on the intricacies of helplines, here's a quick look at how we got on at the Helplines Partnership Annual Conference and Awards Ceremony event in West London. Helplines Partnership are the membership body supporting a diverse range of helplines right across the spectrum. It can be anything from mental health related, physical health related, it could be debt or children related. And we support helplines to try and provide a much better quality service. It's an umbrella organisation um, which all helplines in, across the UK are invited to join. So a sort of support network, we offer training, accreditation, but a membership body really. We're celebrating success, so there's been some Helpline Awards which have been great today where we're actually celebrating people in the sector that are really doing a great job um, and also having some showcases, so in terms of guest speakers who are telling us about their life, the, the experience of their life, so life's journey is our theme for today. So we've had some really good speakers telling us about um, how Helplines have helped them. I'm here to represent the Family Support Helpline, which is a national helpline in Afghanistan and has been active for the past four years. We initially started covering three provinces in eastern Afghanistan. We soon within a year we expanded to 12 provinces. There are 34 provinces in Afghanistan. So within four years we expanded nationally. So right now we, we are covering all 34 provinces of Afghanistan. All the challenges are there. We've been nearly closed down twice. In March this year, we had an ex explosion very close to our office. Uh, two of our staff members were injured, but we also received direct threats, at least three per month uh, from insurgents, that what we do is uh, against their strategy or a policy, but we know what we are there and we know our mission and vision for supporting women because they're receiving conflicting information but we, I want my sisters to know they are allowed to study they're allowed to become who they want to become well I feel that um, you know that the, the helplines conference brings together people that generally you know helplines are very reactive you need to be there you need to be doing the work we very rarely take time out to go and sit away from our desks to think strategically about what we're going to do in the future. And I think 
opportunities like this where a group of like-minded people get together it gives you the chance to speak to others that are in the same sphere as you but also it gives you time I mean for me you know going home at the end of a conference like this I will always have loads of notes and think yeah I'm going to go back I'm going to share it with the organisation and it actually just gives you that that sort of headspace really to, to enable you to do that. We'd like to get awareness out there because of the current pressure on like the police and um, national health services helplines are another source of support so if we can get that message out to the public that to look at our helpline find a helpline service there's always someone they can speak to or contact if perhaps they it's an alternative to a 999 call or going to a and &E. well I've been invited to present uh, the story of my life's journey um, and to really demonstrate from that story um, as we have heard from many of the speakers about triumph over adversity and turning a negative into a positive and giving people hope. I think TV would be a great opportunity, a good investment in promoting it through advertising because that is the way to really reach people through, through the front room. It's really around um, people's kind of response to things, so understanding, not just understanding reactions, but understanding our psychology and our mindset about how we interact with other people, but also how they um, kind of use our services too. So uh, one of the examples I used earlier was someone who might have only just sought help for the first time in years, and seeking help is a really good factor that tells us that they're building some resilience and able to feel like they can make a plan to be more resilient. Mental health is a huge thing. Um, obviously, um, when you've had an accident like mine, so I'm paralysed from the chest down, um, you go through some really dark times, so I'm quite aware um, of that kind of feeling of, like, I had no reason to get up. Um, it's easy to get depressed. Um, and it just happens in a split second so the importance of p speaking to people about it and also from the other side the people that I've spoke to that are newly injured and I've kind of lived through that and, and gone on and done the stuff I've done. I'd ridden the horse for five years, it's actually the horse you saw in the video um, and it was an event we'd competed at the last two years as well so we knew it well but I was in the woodland and the track split into two the horse got his eye on one way, we were meant to be going the other way. He clipped his shoulder on the tree and flung me into the tree. And when I hit the ground, I knew I was paralysed. I'd had bad falls before and always got up. This time was different. I couldn't even feel the ground I was lying on. Um, in the future, um, I'd just like to see it improving as it is. So people are more open, um, able to talk and not feel ashamed of... of a mental illness or any disability. I guess uh, the public, it's about spreading the word, so if people have a good experience with a helpline, you know, to spread that word. And I know um, it's a natural thing not to necessarily talk about things that, that go well. We're all very good at complaining, but actually there's a lot of really good helplines out there. So if people have a good experience, um, please tell others about it and share that good practice and good word. So that was a real insight into the excellent work helplines do. But what impacts can helplines have on people? Well, that's what we went to find out when we filmed tonight's show live from the Helplines Partnership Annual Conference and Awards Ceremony. Today, we are at the Helplines Partnership Annual Conference and Awards Ceremony 2017. As you can see, we have an amazing audience with us today, which is quite a treat. So I'm going to introduce you now to my guest for today. I have next to me here, Keremi Roberts, who's okay. been telling us about her life's journey. Next to her, we have Kirsty Frost, who's the Scope Helpline Manager. We have our resident psychologist on the programme, as you've all seen before, that's Dr. Audrey Tang. And we also have Linda O'Neill from Darlington Young Carers. So we'll be speaking to all of them on today's programme. And that's why I'd like to bring Keremi in because she used the helpline one day, didn't you, Keremi? But first of all, um, tell us a bit about your, you know, what you went through because you started to, to suffer from chronic pain, didn't you? Yeah, um, I have a condition um, that I can't really describe. I can only describe to you kind of how it affects me. Um, and I'm quite a positive person, so I find that quite difficult because it is quite hard. Um, and you mentioned chronic pain, and pain is a very odd thing. It's very clever pain. Um, it's not easy to push through pain it's, uh, when it's all the time, and that's what chronic means, all the time. Um, but um, it affects other things. It affects, obviously, mental health, because it's totally rubbish. Um, and it, um, 
There are other bits and bobs of my body that are doing various things. Um, I've put on a lot of weight, for example, which obviously causes problems. Um, I'm now a diabetic, which is um, um, getting a bit better as I'm losing some weight. Um, and there are lots of other things that kind of affect me day to day. And the, the, the main thing that happened was um, from about the age of 13, um, my, my upper half started behaving differently from my lower half. So, for example, if I stub my toe or twist my ankle, it hurts for a wee bit. Um, a couple of days later, I don't really... I'd forgotten about it as normal. Um, whereas my upper half, um, you know, if I hurt my finger um, or my wrist, um, which I must have done when I was about 12, 13, it lasts. My, my brain doesn't realise that the tissue damage is gone, so the pain continues. Um, and that gradually happened with my neck. And um, about three or four years ago, obviously, the main thing you can see about me is um, I use a wheelchair. Um, and that's because I had a very tiny, minor injury lifting a cake um, about three or four years ago. It's a pathetic injury. Um, but it did cause um, minimal damage, but a lot of pain. And, and that brings with it lots of other things. Um, and so that's the position I'm in at the moment. How, how did you cope when, when you were first um, diagnosed and when, when you were having to go through all of these difficulties? <clears throat> how, what, did you, what were you thinking about yourself? What was going through your mind? How were you coping mentally? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I, I kind of consider myself about four years into my new life because, like I said, I'm a very positive person. Um, and part of... I, I, to be honest, I don't think we were, and I say we because my husband's here, and it is um, very much a family thing. Um, and I was watching Elizabeth and thinking, yeah, you can't possibly, when you're in a family, go through something alone, all of us. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's why Linda's here today, and she'll speak to you that in a minute. But um, I didn't cope, and I was at home, and Andy was work, my husband was working, um, and obviously that's where he needed to be, and I was on my own a lot which is unusual. I'm a teacher. Um, I still am a teacher, although I don't have a classroom or a school anymore because I'm not able to work. Mm -hmm. That, it, it all got on top of me, really. And then we had one day um, where um, two people from Scope came to the door. And um, I don't quite know how they got there, but it was the most wonderful thing because they came to the door and I said, I, I need to sit down. Is that all right? And she said, oh, you're all right. I said, well, I'm actually disabled. And she said, oh, well, you'll know all about Scope then. And I said, well, I don't, actually. I've raised money for them and I've bought a scarf in their charity really? shop. You, you know, <laughs> but I just didn't. And I hadn't thought of myself as a Scope user. I thought of myself as someone who wanted to be a teacher. I wanted to help people. I hadn't thought of myself as yeah. someone to be helped. I'm, I'm a bit embarrassed about that because I think that was quite ignorant, really, um, and possibly arrogant. But... Um, they came to the door and they said, oh, do you know we've got this helpline? And I think to disabled people, helplines are fantastic because they don't involve leave going anywhere. They don't involve the embarrassment of face-to-face. -face. Yeah. Um, if you say the wrong thing or forget something because you're on a lot of medication, it, it doesn't matter. Um, so almost literally as soon as these lovely people had left, um, I, I, I rang the number... Um, is that, is that okay if I yeah, continue? Yeah. So I rang the number, um, and they were they were amazing, actually. Um, they was that were, the first time you'd ever that used was the, the first, helpline? Or? I think so, yeah. How did it feel, actually, speaking to, reaching out and speaking to someone? Really easy, actually. Mm. Um, and I, I don't think people would call me shy, but I was mm. very embarrassed. Mm. I was embarrassed about not working. I was embarrassed that we had no money. I was embarrassed that I needed help with my daughter. I was embarrassed that I wasn't that I wasn't good enough, really. And I, I want to be someone that does things. I'm a very busy person. Being at home on my own watching um, daytime TV it didn't fit mm -hmm. with who I wanted to be. And, and I rang the lady, and I, the only way I can describe it is an absolute total brain dump. Is I, I rang... Which I'm sure a lot of our audience <laughs> are used to. Like, when Thank they... you. <laughs> <laughs> so I rang, and I'm sat with the phone, and I just... Anything that came into my head... And I'm worried about this, and I cried, and she was wonderful. I wish I could thank that lady, actually. Um, in some ways, that's what motivated us to come, was because I can't thank her personally, but I can hopefully show you how much it matters. Um, so, Karen, apart from mm, the actual, obviously, the brain dump <laughs> yeah. that day, and then and, you know, I'm sure you used the helpline after that, what other 
um, help were you offered? Because it wasn't just talking, was it? You got no, quite a lot um, of help. What she decided, what she, we kind of went through things together and she literally said, get a pad and pen and we'll write. Um, and the number one thing was the financial side of it, benefits. I'd had a year and a half struggling with various disability benefits, which won't come as news to anyone that that is mm -hmm. horrific for disabled people and a lot of people. Um, so she, actually the next day, a benefits expert from Scope, because Scope... Um, that was quick. How, uh, well, yeah, they were, no, they were good. They understood yeah. that for us, it, and money, money isn't important until you haven't got much, um, and it becomes urgent. Um, the benefits lady rang me back. She was obviously an expert. She was an expert in benefits, and she was an expert in dealing with people like me, which I thought was important. She didn't... She understood when I asked her to repeat things. Um, okay. She understood when I didn't understand that. You know, she was great. Um, and, and from that, basically, lot, lots of things happened. She enabled me, actually, is, is what she did. Rather than say, do this, do it. She enabled me to be organised. Okay. And, and that led, basically, to um, our benefit situation being a lot better. But also... She introduced other other services That's brilliant. Um, to us as well. So let's bring now um, let's bring Kirsty Frost into this. Welcome to the show, Kirsty, once Thank again. You. So can you tell us a bit more about Scope? Obviously, we've heard some great things already from Kerry and me here, but tell us uh, in a nutshell what, what what is Scope and what do you do? Okay, um, so within Scope, we're a pan disability organisation. We provide a lot of information and advice to parents, carers, disabled people, and other professionals across the sector. I think. Um, Specifically within the helpline, I think it's about providing that support and information that's totally unbiased, non-judgmental as well. Um, and really, rather than telling people what to do, actually present them with those options and yeah. empower them to take. That's really control. important, is it? Because you still want to keep that independence. Mm. You don't want to, you know, have someone take over your life. But the yeah. fact that you work with people and you know, so they can keep that independence as well, I think, is absolutely amazing. Yeah, I mean, I think what Kerry and me described there as well was like being in a complete pickle and mm. not um, being able to sort of see the wood for the tree, so to speak. And I think just from speaking to somebody over a helpline, whoever that might be, um, actually that person relating back to you what you've said to them, sometimes yes. listening, it can really help that person mm. decide yeah. what their priorities are. And as Kerry and me said there, got the pen and paper out, worked <laughs> out what was the most important thing. Yeah. So I think helplines can really provide that pivotal moment yeah. and they can play a real crucial role in really helping people mm. continue to live life happily and independently. I'd like to bring in Audrey now, actually. So Audrey, uh, as you all know, our, our viewers, that she's our resident psychologist on the programme. So what do you think of, of Kerami's story, first of all, Audrey? I think it's a very uplifting, empowering story, and it's just so lovely to meet you, Kerami. And it's great to see how much you've been able to blossom through speaking to the helplines. Um, one thing that Kerami really sort of encapsulates is the behaviour that people have when they ring a helpline. It is often one of the last resorts. There is a lot of fear. They're not quite sure what to say. And the fact that there are so many people out there who can contain that anxiety and not only advise, support, but also signpost for very different parallel services that are just as important is wonderful to see. And it's great that we're celebrating that. Karen, now, um Obviously, you mentioned your family quite a lot there. So you have a husband and a 10-year-old. Can you tell us how they've helped you personally? Yeah, um, I have um, Andrew, who sat at the back. Um, and um, I wouldn't really have been able to come here today without him. Mm -hmm. um, and um, he helps me with... I mean, for example, just before I came on, he was holding a, a mirror so I could put some eyeliner on because I can't do that myself, as, as small things as that. But mainly, um, it's moral support. It's that kind of... Because you're right, I do laugh a lot, but I do cry a lot as well. And um, I, I think um, it's good to have someone keep, push, you know, keep pushing you forward and saying, don't, you know, don't worry, other things will come. He sounds amazing. He is. He's fab. <laughs> and um, the other person who's particularly fab is Emily. Mm -hmm. um, she's very happy for me to um, say her name. Um, and, and that's good, because she is a star. Um, she sees me cry and she sees me laugh. It's very hard to hide things. <laughs> it's very hard to, to hide things from a 10-year-old full stop. But she's, she knows what's going on. Um, and I know some people choose to hide everything from their children, and that's fine. Personally, I, I would hope that she sees us have challenges and she sees us overcome them. 
but obviously with that, she she's supporting me and my husband's supporting me. Um, who's supporting them yes. um, was the big question, really, that actually the lady on the... I don't know her name, this lady on the phone <laughs> from Scope... Um, I said, the, the angel. The, yeah, she was great. Um, and um, she was great, actually, because I was worried that I just wasn't a good enough mum, actually, because I had some friends say, oh, you shouldn't cry in front of your child. Oh. Um, and I was worried about where I was going, and um, I reached out um, to young carers, um, and the very lady that I spoke to on the phone who... Um, allowed me again to brain dump um, all my worries and, and kind of sorted us out actually is, is Linda who okay, so, is here yeah. too. Well don't go away because after the break we show you lots more and we talk to Dr Audrey Tang and Emily Roberts on a point that was lightly touched on just now, the young carers. Before we continue to hear Kerami's story with helplines, here's her daughter Emily talking about her life as a young carer. Well, sometimes I fetch things from mum upstairs, like her phone, some of her medication, um, and I sometimes do a bit of the dishwasher. Sometimes I put the dishes away in the dishwasher and I help out with the washing. Sometimes when my mum's ill, she's in quite a lot of pain, it's kind of unsettling. Um, sometimes I can hear her crying in the night. Um, and I, it makes me wonder if she's alright, but it's alright, but I'm, I'm alright. Yes, I've learnt a lot of life skills, um, like how to put the washing machine on, how to do the dishwasher. Um, I sometimes make my own tea with supervision. Um, so <sighs> when I'm older, I would really like to work with horses because I really love the horses. Well, I think that I can relate to people sometimes, and yeah, I, I do want, I might become a hard time teacher in the future, so it, it's good to know. Thanks so much to Emily there. Now with us to give us some more insight into the life of young carers is our resident expert, Dr. Audrey Tang. Well, the first thing to be very clear on is that we should not be making young people carers, but of course it does happen. And therefore this is an incredibly important topic to, to be discussing. Um, Young carers, and a young carer is defined as somebody under the age of 18, and the average age of a young carer is 12 years old, which is, which is very young indeed, often get involved in a lot of adult responsibilities. Things like cooking, cleaning, shopping, but also getting involved in personal care and sometimes even providing emotional well-being and resilience for that person they're looking after. And with all of these adult responsibilities, they can sometimes lose the, the opportunity to be children. And that's a big thing. They may not have as much privacy as they would like. They may be worried when they leave the house because one of the things that can happen is, depending on who you're caring for, if you're caring for somebody with um, dementia, you may be worried that the second you leave the house, that person may be leaving the cooker on or something like that. If you're caring for somebody who's in a wheelchair, it may be different because once you've left the house and you know that they've got everything that they need, it's possible to, to leave them. They'll be able to cope until you get back. So a young carer has an awful lot of things on their mind. Also, they may be quite isolated. Unfortunately, research has shown, and this is research done by the Carers Trust, that um, 
a number of young people do get bullied. About 28% um, of young people have been bullied because they're carers and that's quite a large percentage. And this can mean that the young person is afraid to ask for help because they don't want to say anything or it might mean that they've been told not to say anything as well because it might be that the parent wants to keep it a secret, wants to keep it quiet for a while or in some circumstances it might be that a parent has come home hung over and tells the child it's food poisoning and so the child maybe at that young age isn't quite sure exactly what's going on and so they find it very difficult to talk to people. So unfortunately being a young carer can lead to things like depression, anxiety, stress. There are many positive sides of it. Young carers can be very kind, compassionate, resilient themselves but it can lead to some severe mental health problems as well. Um, the first thing to do is really talk to somebody. It's quite difficult um, to be able to deal with all of this on your own and also you may not know all of the benefits that you're entitled to, you may not know who to turn to maybe to get transport. One of the biggest problems can be financial in that if you are spending money on the person you're caring for, their, um, their well-being, their medications, uh, any arrangements to the house, all of that sort of thing, there may not be enough money left over for all the other things relating to school and education and learning. So it is important to talk to somebody. If you can talk to a person you can trust, a teacher, um, somebody in the caring professions, in the health professions, that can be really great because they can signpost you to the right places. And when they signpost you, what they'll be able able to do is, is assist you with things like getting out a little bit more um, being able to have time for yourself one piece of advice that I would actually give to teachers and care professionals as well is certainly if a child is caring for a sibling and that sibling goes to that particular school. What's really important is that whilst that child is at school, that child has the time to be independent because in the school there will be other people who can look after and keep an eye on that sibling for a while. It's very difficult if that child is a carer at home, then goes into the school and is a carer at school as well. So it's important there for people just to be a bit mindful. Sometimes even asking the parent if the disability or the, the issue is known to the care professional or to the, the school, it's important to just keep asking, do you have the support you need? Does your child have the support you need? Teachers are now trained to look for um, signs of, of being a young carer and they often do, they're quite similar to neglect. Things like um, a child coming to school a little bit dishevelled, maybe hungry, maybe exhausted, not doing their homework. All of those things can build up into a pattern and it may be mindful to ask that child, is everything okay at home? Don't go away because after the break we continue to show you how we got on at the event and also we have some excellent recipe demonstrations from nutritionist Hannah Richards. Hi, I'm Chrissy B and my show is all about improving your mental health and being happy. Join me every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 10pm on my channel Sky203. Visit chrissybshow.tv for more information and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Chrissy B Show. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Chrissy B Show and on our Facebook page, The Chrissy B Show. Welcome back to The Chrissy B Show, everyone, the TV program that loves to give you advice about mental health and well being. So now it's time to go over to nutritionist Hannah Richards. Hello and welcome to the Chrissy B Show. My name's Hannah Richards and today I'm going to show you how to make some fishy rye bread open sandwiches. So there's a sort of a new name on the street and it's called SMASH and it basically stands for sardines, mackerels, anchovies, salmon and herring. And today we're going to use some herrings, we're going to use some sardines, and we're going to use some mackerel. And these are all really cheap, easy, obtainable uh, fish that you can get from the supermarket and they're really cheap and really easy to use. So I'm going to take some rye bread, I've got some herbs and some um, watercress, courgette and red cabbage. 
So you're gonna take first of all some watercress. Watercress is a really nice salad leaf, nice and bitter. Really helps aid digestion as well, watercress. And it's got a nice peppery taste to it as well. So it's a little bit different than your normal standard lettuce leaf. So there's a little bit of watercress there. I'm then gonna top this one with some sardines. And the, sard um, the sardines, they've got very tiny little bones in them. And don't worry, they, you, can, you can keep them in. You certainly don't need to be deboning them. It would probably take you a very long time and a very frustrating job. So just crush the tin up and then randomly place them all over the rye bread. You can use any bread, but rye is quite, um, quite dense with nutrients as well. So there you've got your sardines. Then we're going to add a little bit of red cabbage and this is pickled red cabbage so you can buy this in a jar in any supermarket as well. And for this one I'm just going to place it on the side of the plate as an accompaniment. It's actually quite sweet so it's a nice flavour to add to the sardines. And then on the side I'm just going to take some dill which is the long green herb. And I'm just going to cut some very small little bits up for a little bit of garnish and scatter it all over the top. And this is quite a fiery one, open sandwich. Cut that in half, you can fold them on top of each other and then a little secret is a hot and sweet mustard. So this is, um, it looks like English mustard, but it's got a really nice little taste to it, a little kick that really makes the, um, brings the flavor out in the watercress and the dill and the sardines. So just scatter it all over the sarni there. And there you've got And there you've got breakfast, it might be lunch, it might be dinner, or it might just be an afternoon snack. So there's one. Then we're gonna move on and use our herrings. And herrings are sort of quite an old fashioned, if you like, fish. People are a bit scared of these oily fishes because we, we don't really know what to do with them. And they're not that common anymore as well, um, unless you're in Scandinavia. So with this one, I'm going to add, start with a little bit of watercress, just to lay down. And then I'm going to use some spiralized courgettes. So the other week we were using courgettes on the show and we just used um, almost like a potato peeler, a julienne potato peeler. But these have been through the spiralizer machine and they've got a little kink to them, a little twirl. So there we go. Now these, this, this, these, these herrings also have a little bit of dill in them as well and some white onion. So you can see they're quite nice chunky bits. And it is, it's quite a fishy job this. And they're all, they're all um, preserved in this vinegar. And you can smell that beautiful flavor already. There's a little bit of carrot in here but nice big chunks of protein there. There we go. That's our second one. We're gonna put that one over here. And with this one, I'm going to chop some parsley. So just get a bunch of parsley and just give it again a nice rough chop and sprinkle it over the top. And we're gonna add a few vine cherry tomatoes for a bit of Garnish, add an extra bit of colour there. I'm gonna open one up. When you buy the tomatoes on the vine, you can really smell them. So it's always worth paying that little bit extra for a beautiful tomato. And there's our herrings with parsley and vine tomatoes. So there's number two. 
So really you can do any of these. There's, there's mackerel as well. I always think mackerel is quite a good uh, breakfast fish as well. You could mix it in with some eggs. You could mix it in with some spinach. Um, so we're just going to use this mustard. So I'm going to start with the mustard on here. A nice generous helping. Spread it out. And then take the mackerel. Again, this is just from a tin in any supermarket. It's probably less than a pound. And just place it evenly over the rye bread. And then just open it up with a fork. And it very easily complies and moves around for you. Oops, there's that. And with this one, I'm gonna add a bit of watercress on top for my garnish. I'm going to add a bit of extra parsley, tear up a little bit of dill, so it's a bit like a herb garden. And remember, you know, your herbs that live in your kitchen or you can buy in the supermarket really, really spice up a dish. They really make a dish look inviting and beautiful and full of vitamins and minerals. So don't be scared of using all your herbs because they really do bring a dish to life. So I'm going to leave that one there. I'm going to put a little bit of red cabbage on the side for a little bit of a taster. And I'm going to garnish it with a few tomatoes around here. Open them up. So it's something different because we all get a bit bored of the same breakfast eggs, avocado. I'm sure there's a lot of people at the moment with avocado intolerances with the amount of breakfast we're all eating. So it's nice to change up your, your breakfast and your lunch with something a little bit different, something very easy, something really cheap and really nutritious. So there's your last one, an array of mackerel with parsley, tomatoes and red cabbage on the side. So there's some breakfasts for you to think about and hopefully enjoy. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I think that the main difference is that um, an allergy affects your immune system and therefore your organs. You can have quite a sharp and immediate reaction to a food, whereas an intolerance is really a more of a complaint that would happen in your digestive system. So it, it would be uncomfortable, whereas an, an allergy would be immediate and cause some sort of problem, um, breathing, skin, something like that. The, the reason people talk about the temperature of the water when eating is really to do with digestion. So digestion wants, nev you never really want there to be any shock coming into the body. And sometimes cold water can create a bit of a shock um, and you gulp it down quicker because it's so cold. So you want it to, ideally it needs to be room temperature, which is nice and calm and easing and digestively um, efficient for the body. Um, well, yeah, absolutely, all of that is true. Um, I think that you can find, well, you can find parasites in lots of different foods, unfortunately, and certainly uncooked food uh, is the higher, you know, you're gonna find parasites there. So depending on the source of the sushi, you know, I would always make sure that you're aware of where that sushi is coming from, how long it's been in that restaurant before it's being served, um, and just do your research because it's very common common to find uh, parasites in sushi, unfortunately, yes. Well, don't go away because after the break, we show you the last part of our Helplines experience and Helena Shard gives you the latest in feel-good news with our very own Julianne Robertson. Welcome back to the Chrissy B Show everyone where today we've been talking all about helplines. So now let's take a look at the last part of the event. So Linda, can you tell us a little bit about your organisation as well? Yeah, um, I work for DISC Dalit and Young Carers. Um, we're based in County Durham. 
What we do is our service works with five to 25 year olds, um, usually who have a substantial caring role within the family. Mm -hmm. um, we work very closely with organisations and, and agencies within the town as well to ensure that we raise a lot of awareness about young carers. Yeah. Um, we've actually had the contract from Darlington Borough Council and NHS Darlington Clinical Commissioning Group now since 2013. Uh, and we've worked with over 400 children and young people, of which I'm very, very proud of. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you think that the young people do kind of get forgotten about, like, they're, you know... Yeah, I think that's why, with, with part of our contract, yeah. a lot of the work we do is awareness raising. Mm -hmm. We go into schools, we go into GP practices, we work with drug and alcohol projects, housing, anything you can think of, really. Yeah. But something that we've particularly done in Darlington is do a schools charter, so that we work with schools, um, so we've got identified leads in the schools. Um, we've also go in, we do school assemblies, so the young people get to understand about young carers. Mm -hmm. We do teacher training. Um, anything we can do, as I say, just to raise that awareness because, because we are aware of the fact that a lot of people don't really know what a young carer is. Mm -hmm. And even within the schools, we've got them to put an action plan into place and also their own individual school policies so that young people are recognised and acknowledged for their caring role. Yeah. I mean, what, what kind of impact is that having on, on the young carers, everything, all the work that you're doing? A lot of the young people feel very alone and feel very isolated yeah, because that caring role can impact a lot. It can impact on the home life, school life, socialising with the peers. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you probably agree with that. Yeah. That, that's a big part of it as well. Socialising particularly, because I, no I noticed, um, you know, because I wasn't, I was literally in the car, uh, like 20 feet away from all the mums talking at the playground. And we did notice that... Um, you know, invitations to things weren't happening because I literally wasn't part of that social group yeah. anymore. It was really hard. Um, that was one of the things that motivated us um, because I felt she needed people around her to understand because most of the time we, we got on really well. Our wee family we, we were fine. What I wanted was for when we did have a crisis, who was my little girl going to turn to? Because the last thing Emily wants to do is tell me that I'm causing her a problem. Um, you know, she doesn't talk to me. She says, oh, I'm fine, mm. a lot. Um, and she's, she is, she's really, ha she is really happy. But on the times that we, you know, we had an occasion where we had the ambulance in the night, she forgot her homework, we couldn't find her shoes. And that was after we had young carer support. Mm. And it just meant that school were aware, it wasn't an issue. Emily went to school in her trainers, no one, cared because they understood that she was helping mum in the night um, and you know if she got tired they helped her and she recovered from that and then the next week she's fine again. Karen thank you so much for sharing your thank story. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you to our much. lovely guest today. We haven't quite finished everybody because guess what I am going to ask our lovely audience to do now. Yes, you've guessed it. It is the MHD Challenge. So I'll just quickly explain briefly to everybody what it's all about. So the MHD Challenge stands for Mental Health Dance Challenge. And it's an idea that I had a couple of years ago, actually, to put a dance together that actually uh, told a story about mental health. And I wanted, through the dance, to actually show a person not accepting the problem and doing nothing about it and then it gets worse, but actually fighting back. So in the dance, you'll see some punching moves, a few different moves. Um, and, the, and we've actually been doing this in some primary schools, haven't we, Audrey? We've been going around to some schools. The kids absolutely love it. I think the teachers are enjoying it more than the kids, actually. It's quite funny. <laughs> Uh, and we're going to be starting secondary schools and universities and colleges next year as well. So it's all about getting, you know, young, especially young children, talking about their mental health early on so they don't keep things to themselves. It's about adults as well that maybe have issues that they've never dealt with, they've never actually gone out to or, or tried to speak to someone or so they've gone through some kind of trauma. It's getting people to talk more about mental health, not be ashamed, not be embarrassed, and get the help that they need. The reason... <laughs> And we have some, oh, you've got your serviettes already. That's amazing, that's wonderful. Okay, so what this is actually about, we had the idea that, you know, this is as though you're saying, I'm waging war against depression, against problems. I'm not gonna let the problems get me down. I'm not gonna 
just stand there and not do anything, I'm going to fight back. So this is why we've got the red, the red flags and Audra and I are wearing red today as well. So I, I'm just going to, I'm going to take you through the basic steps without the music, first of all, okay? So, what you're going to do, first of all, we're going to do the simple part of the dance, which is basically you're just going to go to one side, stomp, stomp, stomp. To the other side, stomp, stomp, stomp. You step back, carry me your point, and you wave. Yeah, yeah, I'm coming to get you kind of way. Yeah, I love that. Oh, that's very good. I need to get you up here with me. I feel a bit intimidated. By... Now you give it a bit of attitude. Well done. again to everyone from the Helplines partnership, to Kerami and to Audrey, Linda and Kirsty too. Now before we go, here's Helena Shard with some positive news in Behind the Fame. Hi guys, welcome back to the Chrissy B Show. Um, I am with the amazing Helena Shard. Too kind. Uh, Hi Julia. It's, it's completely true. <laughs> um, and she is here to get, fill us in on today's yeah. Great and wonderful positive good news. Absolutely. So, so what's been happening, Helena? So helplines. Yeah. It's amazing to research. How amazing are our helplines? Complete lifelines. And yeah. there's small little ones and larger ones. It's been incredible actually reading about, you know, training volunteers up and raising money and there's just so much that goes into it. But um, as we're in dry January, yeah. I felt we should talk, I'm going to talk about a few organisations and, and maybe a few new ones if we have time. Um, I thought it was apt to talk about a small Bristol-based charity called National Association of Children of Alcoholics. Oh, okay. I'd not heard about it. Yeah. And um, so NACA or something. So last year they received 36,000 emails and calls um, and volunteers provided 10,500 hours of support. But as we know, children of alcoholics are twice as likely to have problems at school, three times as likely to consider suicide, just, you know, just general statistics. Yeah. Um, and I think five times more likely to develop eating disorders. So actually, fellow journalist um, Camilla Tomlinson recently um, brought out an article and it's great news because Jeremy Hunt's pledged £500,000 to be given over three years to support children affected by alcoholism. Yeah. And the, 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 it's quite sad in a way, even this is a positive. Um, one of the main reasons why they did, why he's done that is that it's, um, it was highlighted that the uh, people helping the counsellors were being contacted by children as, as young as five. And in fact, they were ringing at night time as well to, to have them read fairy tales to them before bed. That's just, that's that's just, just really, really sad, isn't it? Yeah. And so much so that the, the um, Councillors actually had their books by the phone because people were ringing so often just to read to just them. Just to read to them. Yeah, that's but, I mean, upsetting. Oh it is, God. but it's but it's positive in a way yeah. because obviously you know. Anyway, so that yeah. was that was quite an interesting one to me. Um, and moving on to, I don't I didn't know anything about Logic. I'm sure you know about Logic, the American rapper, yeah, um, singer, songwriter, record producer. He's actually very talented. He's really cool. So I was watching some <laughs> of his stuff. I know it's sort of a little bit behind the times, but so he was, you know, has been raising awareness, suicide prevention. There's a few things on suicide prevention here, yeah. but it's just so happened about. So he. Um, because he released his powerful single and it was the name of the uh, National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. So that was the actual title of the yeah. single. So 1-800-273-8255. Um, and those, so for those suffering suicidal thoughts, obviously it was just a quick way of remembering, getting, like, remembering yeah. it. And so calling them. Really, like, really, really good. Absolutely. 
and also volumes, loads of people contacting the line. And also when he did a great um, performance at the MT Video Music Live, yeah. and again the numbers flashed up and everything, yeah. so lots of people rang. But it was just, yeah, just great. It's getting the awareness out yeah. there, isn't it? Such, such an interesting, like, and just such a simple. Like, yeah, idea, an idea that people are constantly going to be remembering yeah. that, and it was actually really. It's, it's it's to watch if you were to Google it or something. Yeah. It's quite empowering to see him do the the video music MTV Video Music Awards. Yeah. That was really good. Wow. Um, also, moving on again, is, it, there's a rise in the number of children ringing um, helplines about suicide. Oh wow! Um, so it's gone up in a year by 20%, says Childline. And in fact, some other um, Childline, I can't remember the name of the charity, has said it's gone up, but it's a smaller charity, gone up by 50%. So that's in 2016 to 2017. 17. So great that there are places like Childline, and obviously Esther Ranson. Um, Form Childline in 1986. It's 31 yeah. years old. Amazing. I, I can't imagine like life without it. <laughs> I know. Absolutely fantastic. I mean, and wow. still, one in four, uh, you know, youngsters can't get through because they need more investment. They need more pe counselors. They need more they need lines. More yeah. Just, it, yeah, yeah, it is. But also, Dame Esther Ranson. Oh, she's a dame, isn't she? Yeah. Um, she's brilliant. Actually, she's a patron of 19 charities, so oh, she's wow. fabulous. Okay. But she also started the Silver Line charity for, for the elderly. And that's a free line, 24-hour um, confidential helpline for older people who are very lowly, lonely. Because they were saying that it, we're in complete crisis with elderly being lonely. So it's yeah. a really very, very good line. Yeah. Um, and I think that's very exciting. Isn't it? Just yeah. to think, just think, these are lifelines to so many people. Like, which I, is, I know with um, with some elderly people, the closest thing they have for human contact is their television. Yeah, which is so like initiatives like that are just so important. So important. Yeah. And I, TV presenter Fiona Phillips experienced what it was like as well. She did it actually in, for for this line. Thank you so much, Helena. That was so useful, and Thank you. Um, we are definitely going to be looking forward to hearing even more from you next week. Um, so yeah, back to you, Chrissy. That's it for today, folks. But if you have a story that you would like to share, please do get in touch with us on info at chrissyvshow.tv. You can also tweet us at chrissyvshow or leave a message on our Facebook page, The Chrissy B Show. And if you'd like to know how I got help for the problems that I was going through, you can visit my personal website, which is mylifeafterdepression.com. Until next time, bye-bye for now.